Um, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, so my topic uh, today is going to be the regulation of speech platforms. Um, well, uh, let me start a little uh, talking a little bit about the political context of speech platforms. Now, uh, these speech platforms, of which uh, Facebook is now the largest, uh, have become one of the most important parts of the digital public sphere. And in fact, they've largely eclipsed the world of digital communication that existed from around 1995 or so to around 2010. So in fact, their dominance is only about uh, 10 years old, but they're probably going to stay with us for some time. Now, Facebook itself may not be with us uh, forever, although it sometimes seems as if that's true. But there will probably be another speech platform that replaces it, and, and the affordances of speech platforms, what they allow you to do and what they don't allow you to do, how they're designed, those things will change over time, too. Um, so let me talk a little bit about important aspects of speech platforms that are relevant to the political context. The first important thing about speech platforms is that they have the ability to govern populations. And uh, that is different than uh, media in the 20th century. Uh, uh, newspapers did not have the power to govern populations. They could influence them, uh, but they actually couldn't set rules for them and enforce them. Uh, the pl uh, speech platforms create rules and they enforce them, although they don't have the same uh, a group of enforcement mechanisms that uh, territorial states do. They have much more limited uh, set of enforcement powers they can uh, kick you off a site, they can uh, kick you off temporarily or permanently, they can slow down what you say, they can block what you say. So uh, they have a set of tools to enforce their rules, and they're just more limited um, uh, than what states can do, but still they have the ability to govern. They also have the ability to manipulate, of course, and influence, but that was also true of 20th century media. The second thing is that speech platforms are part of a larger system of private surveillance. Uh, it may have occurred to you that uh, Google, for example, gives away an enormous number of free services and software, uh, maps and email, and uh, they've gotten into self-driving cars and various other kinds of things. And Facebook is trying to move into virtual reality and payment systems in addition to having a messaging service and several different kinds of social media uh, systems. And the reason for that is very simple. Uh, Google and Facebook are actually surveillance companies uh, that they do search and social media on the side. Um, and that's the best way to think about them and understand uh, how they work. Uh, that's because speech platforms are a special case of uh, mm -hmm. a, a social development of the uh, early 21st century uh, that I call the algorithmic society. And so what's the algorithmic society? Well, it's a society in which public actors and private actors try to govern populations through algorithms. And the point of, the goal of the algorithmic society is practical omniscience. It's the ability to predict uh, what people are going to do, what they want, what they desire, and therefore to use that knowledge to nudge them, control them, and in some cases manipulate them. Um, the algorithms in turn depend on data collection, uh, collation, and analysis. And uh, essentially, in the algorithmic society, the person with the most data wins. Uh, and vast sums have been invested by private companies and by governments for this purpose. Uh, and because of the, of the rise of these new forms of private governance, you get a new kind of politics, uh, which is a kind of balance of power politics, uh, to use a very old metaphor. Uh, so in the 20th century, we might think of freedom of speech as being an issue of individual freedom or freedom of the press uh, between the state and uh, between private individuals or media companies. Uh, but that's not really what's going on in the 21st century. In the 21st century, freedom of speech is really about a balance of power between a bunch of different forces uh, in society. And the freedom basically emerges from the struggle between these multiple forces. Now, in, in previous writing, I've called this a pluralist model of free speech. And for convenience, I analogize it to a triangle. Um, that is to say, you have uh, territorial governments on one side of the triangle, and you have owners of private infrastructure on, on the other side of the triangle. And then at the bottom of the triangle, you have civil society and end users uh, who are governed both by 
uh, nation states on the one hand and by uh, private infrastructure on the other. And in fact, I've talked about this in previous work. I, I said that the old school of, of speech regulation is when the territorial governments try to regulate civil society. The new school is when territorial governments go after the infrastructure owners and try to get them uh, to govern uh, speech. And then of course, what makes that possible is the fact that infrastructure owners, including speech platforms, have the ability to govern. This is private governance. Now. I, I described it in terms of a triangle, but the, the system is actually far more complicated than a simple triangular relationship. So, for example, uh, the, the various territorial governments influence each other in lots of different ways. Uh, many of you, of course, have heard of the Brussels effect, which is the, the idea that uh, uh, Europe's regulation of the Internet and its privacy regulations will have influences in other countries. And I have spoken about the idea that the internet is governed by three empires. Uh, the empire of the United States, which is primarily libertarian and focuses on the, uh, on the uh, projection of corporate power. Uh, the European empire, which is primarily bureaucratic, technocratic, and focuses on uh, regulation. And then the Chinese empire, which is an empire which basically has more or less, uh, you know, almost total control within its uh, ter uh, territorial ambit, but basically influences other countries um, uh, through a whole different set of means of persuasion, but also through hardware. Um, and uh, all the other states in the world are influenced by these three empires uh, of the internet, and some of them are more powerful than others. Uh, and uh, they are more influenced than others by the influence of these three empires of the internet. And uh, with respect to private infrastructure, there are many, many differences uh, in interest among the various infrastructure owners. Uh, broadband companies have different interests than social media companies. The different social media platforms have different interests. And so they're struggling uh, with each other as well. They're also competitors. And then finally, the civil society, which is at the bottom of the triangle, has its own forms of power. So uh, some of you may uh, have been following in the news uh, the uh, exposés of uh, Francis Haugen and the Facebook files. Um, and you might think about the Facebook files in terms of a blow for transparency or accountability. But if we think about the Facebook files from the standpoint of the, uh, the, the free speech as a triangle or the analysis of power mm -hmm. characteristic of the 21st century, this is actually an attempted exercise of power by the bottom of the triangle. That is, civil society institutions and legacy media are attempting to exert their influence in order to influence governments, uh, governments which are on another side of the triangle. And, and why do I put it this way? I mean, why do I, why do I put it in terms of this sort of set of power relations? Well, the answer is, if you think about what are the major strategies of power at the bottom of the triangle, that is, of civil society, there are really basically only two. Um, one strategy is exit. So you can just basically have nothing to do whatsoever with uh, infrastructure companies, but that's very, very hard to do. And the other possible strategy of power is voice. That is protest, uh, uh, bringing things to the uh, attention of governments, uh, pushing for transparency and, uh, and related kinds of strategies. And so you can understand that the Facebook files uh, are an example of the way the bottom of the triangle exerts power uh, with respect to the uh, owners of private infrastructure. So I'm going to talk about uh, potential reforms in a second. Uh, but when I talk about reform, you have to keep in mind that um, uh, some of the reforms that people will be pushing for are actually not going to be improvements in the system of free expression, there are going to be various forms of new school speech regulation, and by which I mean that under the guise of reform, governments uh, of different types often just want speech platforms to do their work for them. Um, so what is it that governments want infrastructure owners to do for them? What are the tasks that they want infrastructure owners to perform for them? Well, generally speaking, they want infrastructure owners to uh, limit the speech of various participants. They want to track what people are doing, and they want to surveil people. Um, those are the, the three major things that, that uh, governments want from speech platforms. Uh, that they, they primarily want to piggyback on uh, the power that platforms have for governing 
observing, surveilling, collecting data, and, uh, and monitoring people. And this is what I call the new school of speech regulation. And um, to give you two examples with, very different, um, with a very different political cast, one is the right to be forgotten. Uh, the right to be forgotten, of course, is the product of the European Court of Justice interpreting the, uh, uh, the Euro uh, European privacy law. But if you think about what uh, the right to be forgotten is from the standpoint of the model of the triangle, uh, you can see that it's an attempt by European states to turn a private company, Google, into a private bureaucracy of first resort. So that uh, if you want something to be delisted from the search results, what you do instead of going to a public authority, you go to a private bureaucracy. Google has been directed to create its own private bureaucracy and then it hears claims being brought by various folks who would like to have delisting and then uh, Google basically reports on it to uh, European states. And of course, if people don't like Google's uh, response, they can of course appeal uh, to a court or administrative agency. But essentially what Google is, is playing the role of is it's playing the role of the, the lowest level of bureaucracy in a government system. Another example of how this works is agreements that the European uh, Union reached with the big four companies, Microsoft and uh, 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 Apple, I believe, and, and Facebook and Twitter, uh, to take down hate speech promptly. Germany went a bit further in, in passing the Nets DG law, and the Nets DG law is also an attempt to try to harness the powers of the largest social media companies to act as private bureaucrats. It basically enjoins social media companies, the largest ones, to take down obviously illegal content within 24 hours and illegal content within a week or so. Um, and sometimes, as in the case of NetsDG, the basic goal here is simply to get speech platforms to take down content that is already illegal in the particular jurisdiction. So NetsDG is aimed at content that is illegal in Germany. Uh, but often, especially if you think about the United States, countries want companies to take down content that is not illegal at all, uh, but that they uh, want to discourage or disfavor. Um, and some, company, uh, some countries may want a few of the large companies, uh, may actually like having a, a, lot, a, a small number of very large companies. And why? Well, they're easier to co-opt. They're easier to make bargains with than if there were very many, many uh, different kinds of companies. Uh, so that's, uh, that's truly Europe and the United States. But now think about all the other countries in the world. In some of these, uh, some of these countries have governments that are not particularly strong. Um, and don't have very much bargaining power with respect to the largest speech platforms. Um, they may not have very good, much in the way of regulatory apparatus. Um, and in those countries, the speech platform like Facebook may be the only game in town. And indeed, uh, what you may get is instead of attempts at regulation, what you get are attempts at uh, co-optation uh, of the speech platform by whatever government you have. That Which leads me to another point, which is, this new school of, of speech regulation um, is not just simply about harnessing, uh, co-opting, or coercing speech platforms uh, into removing content that uh, a state doesn't like. Uh, some authoritarian countries uh, want the opposite. Uh, they want to prevent. Uh, uh, they want to prevent platforms from removing content. And the reason why is because their interest is flooding the zone with pro-government propaganda. So in Brazil and the United States, which I'm not asserting that uh, Brazil or the United States are authoritarian governments, uh, but they are they have been run by populist uh, politicians, uh, right-wing movements uh, have been pushing to prevent uh, platform companies from targeting disinformation and propaganda. In China, the states, one of the state's uh, major techniques uh, is to uh, uh, flood uh, uh, social media companies with uh, distracting content, uh, so as basically to change the subject uh, in the face of criticism and, and prevent criticism. Uh, these strategies, flooding the zone strategies, uh, uh, preventing, regular, uh, preventing uh, content moderation in order to uh, make uh, Make, uh, make the system uh, more available for disinformation and propaganda um, are an important part of the new school of speech regulation. And they're designed to capitalize on the economy of attention that's characteristic of the early 21st century. So that was the first part of my talk. Uh, 
the first part of my talk was to give you sort of the political context of the regulation of speech platforms. Uh, and the second part of my talk now is going to be about suggestions for regulations of speech platforms. Now, when we talk about regulations of speech platforms, the most important question you want to ask at the very beginning is very simple. Why are you interested in regulating? That is to say, what is the goal of your regulation? Uh, many debates over uh, regulation of speech platforms actually don't begin with a central question. Uh, so let me give you some possible suggestions for my, why you might be interested. Uh, probably the most overarching reason for speech regulation, uh, regulation of social media platforms is because you want a healthy and vibrant uh, digital public sphere. But these are metaphors, healthy and vibrant. What is the normative set of commitments that are behind these metaphors of a healthy digital public sphere or a vibrant digital public sphere? Well, generally speaking, um, the, uh, the normative values of the public sphere are the normative values uh, underlying the basic freedom of expression. They are political democracy, uh, cultural democracy, and the growth and spread of knowledge. Uh, when you uh, read uh, the literature on the reform of social media, you'll find that a very large number of arguments focus on democracy as the primary uh, goal of regulation of social media. But it's worth emphasizing that democracy is not a single concept. There are many, many different kinds of democracy. And depending upon the kind of democracy you're actually after, you might get a very different kind of media policy. Just to give you a couple of examples. So suppose on the one hand, you are I believe in a sort of Schumpeterian elite conception of democracy, in which it's really important for elites to be drummed out of office and replaced with other elites. So you just want rotation in office. You want for fair and free elections. For that, you might be interested in a set of media rules that focus on transparency uh, or on the ability to basically inform elites about particular issues. But you're actually not all that interested in wide-ranging participatory democracy. Well, that will take you in a very different direction in terms of what your media policy will be if instead your vision of democracy is participatory and in which you actually want to encourage uh, the largest possible number of people uh, from in, uh, to in, you want to encourage them to engage in uh, political discussion and debate. Uh, participatory democracy tends it takes you in a very different direction in terms of what you might want from a media strategy. The same thing is true if your focus is pluralism, a democratic pluralism, that you want to make sure that lots of different types of groups in society, different cultures, different interests are all represented and have a, a relatively equal ability to participate. There too, you might have a very different set of media regulations. Uh, uh, similarly, your focus might be on participation or your focus might simply be on an informed public, even if the vast majority of the public is not actively involved in democracy. And then finally, uh, my own writing is about the idea of cultural democracy, which is about the widespread participation of people in culture. And that actually is quite the same thing at all as political democracy. Political democracy rests on cultural democracy, but the two are not the same thing. And then next, I just want to point out that although much of the literature talks about the protection of democracy, democracy is actually not the only value at stake. Uh, most people online don't actually talk about politics at all. They talk about gossip. They talk about sports. They talk about popular culture. They talk about their favorite band. They talk about their families. They talk about recipes for cooking. They talk about weddings they attended, travel, vacations, and so on. So uh, these things are part of cultural democracy. That is the kind of freedom of cultural participation that's necessary for a free society. But you know, it's much more than just simply a focus on democratic deliberation, for example. And there are other values we might be interested in as well. We are interested in public health. We're interested in bodily security. We're interested in privacy and consumer protection. And above all, we may be very concerned about uh, manipulation, both by powerful private and public actors. And then there's also the effects of global inequality. Um, whatever rules are chosen for the regulation of speech platforms will have different effects on minority groups around the world and also on poorer countries. Um, some reforms that uh, tend to benefit wealthier countries uh, that have the power to regulate may sometimes have beneficial effects on other countries, but sometimes they may have little or no effect. And in some cases, 
they actually may have uh, disastrous consequences. Uh, so all of these things you have to keep in mind when you think about uh, social media reform. Um, so uh, the next thing I really want to emphasize for you is that a vast amount of uh, literature on social media platforms and social media reform has focused on altering the rules of content moderation, either taking things down or leaving things up. In my view, that's actually not where uh, reform should be directed. My view is that the basic problem with social media platforms, and especially the largest ones, Facebook uh, and its family of companies and YouTube, uh, is that their business models create bad incentives. And these bad incentives in turn cause them to pursue profits at the expense of undermining the health and vibrancy of the digital public sphere. And this creates harms to democracy, uh, to public health, and to physical safety. Now, it's also true that these companies, most of which are headquartered in the United States and have uh, American ownership, tend to devote less attention to countries outside the United States and Europe, and that makes the harms worse in those countries. So, for example, this is a point that Frances Haugen made in, uh, in her uh, uh, public statements, the, the very best version of Facebook is the one that you're likely to see in the United States. And the reason for that is very simple. That's where most people are complaining, and that's where most of the people who complain that Facebook actually cares about come from. So that, in fact, if you actually want Facebook to reform its practices in Sri Lanka, for example, uh, it's actually best to get Americans upset about what's going on in Sri Lanka, uh, because Facebook will probably pay more attention there, or, uh, or to have the European Union be upset about what's happening in a particular country, because uh, Facebook cares most about what uh, the opinion of the Europeans is. Uh, a, a lot of the debate of social media reform is directed at giving advice to companies about how they might uh, make themselves better, more public spirited, how they might change their uh, systems of uh, their algorithmic systems or their privacy systems uh, to be more protective of important interests. But and there's nothing wrong with this advice. Um, I think it's it's fine. Obviously. Con uh, companies are influenced by this advice to a certain extent, and some of the advice is extremely useful. But um, you, you should understand that you really can't rely on self-regulation alone if you want to improve the quality of social media services. And that's because largely self-regulation means no regulation. Uh, companies are inevitably going to be driven by their business models. Uh, and the advice that they get uh, for self-regulation is not really going to change that. And that's why if you want to reform social media, you have to reform informational capitalism itself. And that's really the most important thing I want to offer you in this talk. If you want to reform social media, you really have to reform informational capitalism. You have to re uh, reform the way in which our algorithmic society has basically been developed. Well, that sounds like a pretty tall order. How would you go about doing this? Well, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to discuss three different uh, ways you might do it, three different types of policy interventions you might be involved in. Um, th these are three different kinds of regulation. In each case, I'm interested in the question of what kinds of effects on the digital public sphere these kinds of reforms might produce. And I'm going to emphasize also that none of these reforms that I'm going to discuss by themselves would solve all the problems. Each attacks a small part of the problem. Some of these reforms make problems uh, in other areas worse, actually. So you need to uh, other kinds of regulations to compensate. Let me give you an example. Uh, antitrust reforms can often undermine uh, digital privacy. Uh, privacy and consumer protection reforms don't necessarily uh, solve the problems of market concentration. And depending on how they're done, uh, some of these regulations can act as barriers to entry. The, th the key thing I want you to realize is that the, the form of economic uh, power that social media companies have today didn't occur overnight. And it didn't occur because of a, a single mistake that was made by uh, countries, especially the United States, in regulation. Rather, it is the outgrowth of decades of changes, subtle, often subtle changes in law, in many different areas of law um, that began in the 1980s. And uh, they were changes in tax law, changes in contract law, intellectual property law, telecommunications law, a whole bunch of different areas.
And it was these changes in law, which in fact are characteristic of the, uh, of the neoliberal period in the United States uh, and its legal regime, that also made social media, it gave them the opportunity to be so powerful today. Uh, and so if you want to uh, uh, reform these companies, you're going to have to act in multiple directions at once. And that's because, in fact, there are many different overlapping areas of law that are the source of economic power. Okay, well, let me begin. And the first uh, uh, set of reforms I want to discuss are, are antitrust and competition reforms. Now, now, these reforms are primarily about achieving uh, increased pluralism in the digital public sphere. Uh, these kinds of reforms may have some but only modest effect on a lot of the things people complain about. In some cases, antitrust reforms can actually increase uh, problems of digital privacy. So you can divide these antitrust and competition reforms into um, you know, three basic elements. First of all, you can have horizontal reforms that break up very large companies into smaller ones. Uh, for convenience, imagine a world with 50 little Facebooks. Just uh, so imagine 50 little Mark Zuckerbergs skewering around. So 50 little Facebooks. But what would be the advantage of, of uh, increasing the number of players from the standpoint of the health of the digital public sphere? Well, you might get more competition out of it. That means that the companies might compete over offering different kinds of features, uh, different affordances. They might compete over offering better privacy. They might compete over offering better security. They might compete over offering uh, better content moderation or content moderation that people would prefer more. Uh, and so uh, the, the very simple argument for a horizontal competition reform is just basically to create more opportunities and it's based on the idea that the current bargain that most people have with social media companies is that they surrender information about them and in return they get a set of services. But since the, there is um, uh, only a small number of these companies and they're very powerful, they don't actually have to offer very good service. And by service, I mean things like privacy, content moderation, safety, security. And in some parts of the world, uh, the quality of service they offer is not very good at all. And so if you had lots and lots of different companies, as a classic argument, you might have improvements because there would be competition. So that's the horizontal idea. The vertical idea is very simple. Um, the largest companies, Facebook and Google, are vertically integrated. Uh, they, uh, have, uh, they are not only social media companies, search engine companies, they're also advertising networks. And indeed, they have stranglehold over the advertising networks. And the advertising networks are actually much of the source of their economic power. So you might, in fact, require them to separate out their advertising networks from their social media or search engine services. And that also might uh, increase uh, competition and produce better results. And then the third set of reforms concerns the problem of network effects. Think about it this way. If you broke up uh, a very large company like Facebook tomorrow into 50 little Facebooks, uh, there would be a serious problem with this reform. And the problem would be that uh, people want to belong to networks that other people belong to. That is to say, there are network effects. There are advantages of network effects. Uh, and so what you might have in a very short period of time is that the 50 little Facebooks would turn once again into one or two extremely large uh, social media platforms with a bunch of tiny little, uh, surrounded by a bunch of tiny little platforms. And the reason would be because of network effects. So if you want to have any kind of antitrust reform, you have to figure out what to do about the problem of network effects. And the simplest way to solve the problem is to require interoperability. Uh, and there are many ways in which you can do interoperability with respect to social media platforms. Um, I can give you just a few examples. Uh, but the key idea, all of them, is that if I belong to social media platform A, I nevertheless have the ability to communicate with people on social media platform B and they have the ability to communicate with me. And in fact, I have access to a wide range of different social media platforms to communicate with. And the effect of this kind, basic type of interoperability reform is that it shifts the benefits of network effects from the individual companies to the society as a whole. If you wanna see an example, and it's really a rough analogy, it's not a perfect analogy, think about telephone networks. Imagine a world, as you had in the early 20th century, in which there were a bunch of private telephone networks. Well, if I was on telephone network A and I wanted to call you, 
and you were on telephone network B, I couldn't call you. Uh, and therefore, everyone would have an incentive to join telephone network A because everybody could talk to everybody. Uh, the effect of requiring these private telephone networks to become interoperable was that the benefits of being able to talk to everyone were now distributed among all the end users, as opposed to being concentrated in the companies themselves. And that's the central reason why you want interoperability reforms. <laughs> and as I said before, there are so many different ways to do it. I don't really have time to talk, uh, deal with them in this talk, but that's the basic principle. There is one danger when we think about competition reform and antitrust reform, and it's simply this. A lot of governments say they want antitrust reform and competition reform, but they don't really. Uh, many governments actually prefer to have a relatively small number of very large companies. And why? Well, because it's easier to deal with them. Uh, so if you think about the European Union's relationship to the big four platforms, it's much easier to strike bargains with four platforms than with 50 platforms or 100 platforms. Similarly, uh, many countries, I'm not just singling out the European Union, uh, the United States is, is probably the most important example, like having a relatively small number of uh, platforms because it makes surveillance easier. Again, it's much easier to deal with a small number of companies if basically your interest is, uh, is uh, surveillance than it is for dealing with a very large number of companies. So what we may have with respect to uh, different countries, the United States and Europe, is that they may tend to talk out of both sides of their mouths. They may on the one hand want competition reform and antitrust reform, but they also may resist certain kinds of antitrust reform because it would undermine the ways in which they engage in new school speech regulation. And that's why um, it's, I have emphasized in the first part of my talk undering the, understanding the political context in which demands for social media reform occur. The companies in turn will argue that they need to be big to make use of economies of scale in providing safety and security. They hire lots of social researchers and data scientists, but it's not clear at all uh, that content moderation, safety, and security scale very well. Um, in fact, uh, the revelations from the Facebook files that we've been reading about uh, in the media suggest that scale do does very little to produce better uh, security, and in some cases make things worse. Uh, there is an enormous amount of discrepancy between the attention that Facebook gives to the United States and Europe on the one hand, and the attention it pays to the rest of the world with respect to issues of safety and security. Uh, examples are recent stories about political violence in India and in other parts of Southeast Asia that have basically been stoked by uh, the social media policies of Facebook. Uh, Facebook, not surprisingly, has devoted relatively little resources to the most populated parts of the world, and it has not been particularly competent in understanding the relevant languages in these parts of the world. So you want to back up and ask yourself what antitrust and competition law are getting you. They may not get you a great deal of accountability. They may not get you a great deal of increased responsibility. Mostly what antitrust and competition law gets you is pluralism and competition. And the hope is that pluralism and competition will, in the long run, lead to better behavior because consumers will demand better behavior. Uh, and a healthy digital public sphere should have lots of people competing with each other. That's another reason why you might want uh, pluralism. And competition for end users may cause more investment in what end users want as opposed to what advertisers want. Uh, so those are the advantages. And similarly, um, uh, social, if you have many social media companies, it's harder for governments to co-opt them. And it's harder for propagandists to game their algorithms to make money from spreading disinformation uh, and, and so forth. Um, so social media pluralism is a valuable reform. It addresses a lot of problems, but not all of them. Uh, one problem is that if you have 50 little Facebooks and they're all competing with each other, they're all going to practice surveillance capitalism. And since, as I said before at the beginning of this talk, uh, in the uh, algorithmic society, the person with the most data wins, uh, these 50 little Facebooks will uh, probably engage in increasingly abusive practices to get more data. And there may also be, as Evelyn Duick has pointed out, there may be content moderation cartels which undermine uh, the benefits of diversity. Um, and if what you're trying to do is appeal to consumers, you also have to deal with the fact that consumers uh, have maybe subject to behavioral limitations in judgment. They may underestimate risks and so on. Um, so essentially, there are limits to what you can do through antitrust and competition reform, which means that you need a second lever of regulation. And I'm going to talk about that. 
The second lever of, of uh, regulation is privacy and consumer protection. And I put them together because in the 21st century, privacy and consumer protection are really two sides of the same coin. So if you know anything about the history of consumer protection in the 20th century, you know primarily it's about uh, ensuring a safe products that do what they're supposed to do and that don't injure consumers. The classic example in the United States uh, was um, a, a, a case about a Coke bottle uh, that when you picked it up, it exploded in your face. Right. Uh, in the 21st century, however, we're not only interested in questions of consumer safety and that products do what they're supposed to do, we're also interested about privacy and surveillance and manipulation. The basic problem of, uh, the basic problem of consumer protection in the 21st century is not that your Coke bottle will explode in your face. The basic problem is that your Coke bottle is secretly spying on you. So uh, there are various different kinds of solutions to this. Uh, Europe has a general data protection regulation uh, which has been highly influential around the world. My own contribution to this particular debate is the idea of information fiduciaries. And that's simply the idea that digital businesses that collect data around end users have a fiduciary duty toward the people whose data they collect. And the reason why they have this duty is because there's an enormous asymmetry of power and of knowledge between companies on the one hand and end users on the other. Uh, users are made vulnerable uh, in receiving services and because of that vulnerability, that's the classic reason why would you would impose some kind of fiduciary obligation. And in fact, the problems of vulnerability and the asymmetries of power and of knowledge are even greater uh, with respect to these 21st century companies than they ever were with the traditional fiduciaries in the profession. The fiduciary duties are basically duties of care, duties of confidentiality, and above all, loyalty, and they require uh, not only that there be particular uh, duties imposed, but also uh, obligations of privacy by design, uh, and also other kinds of reforms that would affect uh, issues of safety and security. Um, you can put the fiduciary duties in the digital media companies themselves, or as some people have suggested recently, you can actually create a set of data intermediaries, independent companies that have fiduciary duties, and their basic task is to bargain with digital platforms broadband companies, cellular operators, and internet of things companies in order to strike the best bargains on behalf of, of the people they represent. So there's more than one way actually to implement a fiduciary model. It's very important to understand that these fiduciary models like antitrust models are not directly designed to change content moderation. They have only indirect effects on content moderation. Uh, you are responsible for harms to your end users that result from how you process data. And that means you have to be especially careful in how you construct and implement the algorithms that are based on the data. Okay, I've just given you two big large areas of social media reform. One is antitrust and competition law. The other is privacy and consumer protection law. The last one is the one that everybody talks about all the time, but I think actually um, is the least important. And this is the reforms to the rules uh, involving intermediary liability uh, and also intermediary immunity. These are the classic rules that you place on duties on platforms to moderate certain kinds of content. And in my view, the problem with uh, emphasizing these kinds of reforms is that they just produce different forms of new school speech regulation. They're primarily about getting uh, social media companies to do the government's work for them. Um, so. I, I'm not opposed to some of these reforms. I myself have advocated some kinds of reforms in intermediary liability, but I don't think they're the primary issue. And the reason why is very simple. I said earlier that the central problem uh, with social media is the business model. And that if you want to reform social media, you have to reform the underlying business model. Well, uh, intermediary liability rules don't significantly change the underlying business model of many companies they will have effects at the margins, but they don't really change the data collection systems. They don't really change the algorithmic uh, society that we've produced. What they are are problems that address the issue from the edge of the system rather than going to the heart of the system, which is the structure of capitalism. My own view is that I would keep intermediary uh, immunity rules uh, pretty much as they are, but I would uh, offer a bargain to the largest social media companies uh, and Internet of Things companies, too, uh, that collect data for purposes of surveillance and control. And so what I would say is if you want the intermediary immunity rules, 
then we're going to require from you a series of obligations of transparency, uh, the ability of having uh, inspectors inspect your algorithmic systems and the design of those systems. I'm going to require you to uh, adopt fiduciary duties, and I'm going to uh, require you uh, to uh, basically uh, give some account of how you're producing or, re or limiting virality of, uh, of, of particular kinds of content. In other words, what you're doing is you're using intermediary immunity rules as a kind of lever uh, to get uh, the adoption of public interest obligations on the part of social media companies. Uh, how this would work would be very different in Europe than it would be in the United States. And the reason is very simple. It's much easier to regulate these kinds of things in Europe than it is in the United States because of the American First Amendment. Uh, going through a kind of public interest obligation that is based on a bargain it makes more sense in the United States because of our First Amendment. In Europe, it may not be necessary to do it this way, but I think there are some advantages to, to this kind of solution. All right, so what have I done in this talk? I've given you an account of the sort of political economy of social media. I've talked about the pluralist model of power and power relations that are central to understanding what's going on. And I've given you three different models of how you might engage in the regulation of social media companies. The big takeaway from this talk is very simple. The social media systems we have today, the, the speech platforms we have today are an outgrowth of the forms of capitalism that developed uh, in the algorithmic society. And if you want to make speech platforms work better, if you want them to serve the public interest, if you want a healthy and vibrant digital public sphere, you have to go to the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter is the design of informational capitalism. Thank you very much, and I'll take your questions. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, I'm going to help and uh, bring the microphone to you. Thank you very much. My name is George Zerde. I'm working here in the uh, Institute of Information Society, and I have a, uh, a question. Um, you were talking about that we have to change the, the, the core of informa uh, informational capitalism and change the business model, because the business model is the, is the, the problem. But uh, if we change, and now it is that they, uh, these speech platforms are collecting data and they are selling advertisements uh, and targeting adver advertisements. Uh, uh, to the users based on this data. How would you change this? How the new business model would look like? Uh, because I just simply cannot, cannot imagine that. Well, it's very important to understand that to change a business model does not mean that you completely go in a completely different direction. So imagine that you had fiduciary duties, for example. You might still have various targeted forms of advertising. Uh, but uh, there are many different ways of organizing targeted advertising, uh, which you may well understand. Uh, so you can have contextual advertising, which is different than behavioral advertising. And indeed, even within the realm of behavioral advertising, there are multiple ways of doing it. Uh, the key idea of, of imposing a particular kind of business obligation would say, well, if you want to engage in targeted advertising, you can continue to. But we're going to put restrictions on the way in which you engage in targeted advertising. Uh, if your business model is premised on the maximization of attention, we will still allow you to try to increase attention. After all, we allow that to 20th century media. 20th century media are about the, the maximization of attention, right? That was certainly true with television and radio. But we're going to put uh, some limits on the way in which you can do it. Uh, and so the central idea is not to say, well, we're not going to let you make money anymore. We're not going to let you sell advertisements anymore. Instead, it's rather to put some limits on it. Here's a, 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 here's a way of thinking about it. In the, in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, uh, democracies around the world, and, not, uh, and the United States especially, uh, looked at the uh, delivery of food services, uh, the production of, uh, uh, of meat and uh, vegetables and also medicines and drugs. And they found that uh, there were many shady and illicit practices that were going on. Um, and so they changed the way in which these companies did business. In the United States, they passed the Food and Drug Act of 1906, and there were any number of different reforms. Did these changes mean that people stopped selling meat? No. Did it mean they stopped selling vegetables? No. Uh, 
Did it mean that there was no drug industry in the United States? No. In fact, the drug industry in the United States took off and became far more powerful and influential than it had been at the turn of the century. Rather, it was the system of regulation tamed the worst instincts of these particular models of making money and diverted them toward a more public-spirited goal. And I think that's part of the story. There is a second part of the story. One of the major problems, and I think this is a characteristic of the American approach to uh, media policy, and it has been really from the beginning, very different from the approach uh, in Europe. Americans have largely thought that media should be primarily privately owned. Uh, and so it has, it has really not had very much investment in public media. Now, Ethan Zuckerman, uh, who's at Amherst now, was at MIT for a while, has basically devoted his career to strategies for the development of public service pub, uh, media, the social media. And these would not completely displace the existing uh, media, social media we have. Rather, they would sit alongside it. They would offer opportunities. They would be in a public option, if you will, for different kinds of social media. And of course, if you combine the, the existence of these public media with interoperability requirements, remember this is a competition issue, then in fact, it would be possible for people to sign up with a public option and still have the ability to communicate with people who were using a, a privately owned media. So the goal here is not to destroy, uproot and, uh, root and branch the whole system uh, that we've developed in the digital age, but rather to tame its worst instincts and to provide additional opportunities. Thank you very much for your detailed elaboration. And I see two more hands uh, in the air here in the front row. I'm Peter Nadori here from the uh, Information Society Institute. Uh, my question would be, how do you see this uh, whole story playing out? I mean, in three, five, ten years' time, do you see the U.S. government, European government engaging uh, with the reform of information capitalism realistically? Well, uh, so here I don't have very good news for you, uh, so I, I simply want to uh, uh, tell you a little historical analogy. So uh, here uh, in the United States, uh, which I'll use because I know it best, uh, you have the growth of industrial capitalism in the second half of the 19th century uh, and the creation of what in the United States is called the Gilded Age. Uh, that Gilded Age uh, essentially runs through the end of the 19th century and early into the 20th century and leads, gives way to a series of reform efforts in the United States at least, which are re referred to as the Progressive Era and eventually uh, into the New Deal. If you think about that timeline, that is a timeline that runs roughly about half a century uh, between the worst excesses of industrial capitalism and the series of reforms that occur in layers that basically uh, change the rules of industrial capitalism uh, to make it more humane, not completely humane, of course. All right, and if we were to tell the story in Europe, the story too would, it would be a slightly different time, set of times, but it would run over decades rather than simply be something that happened in a short space of time. Now it's possible uh, because of everything is faster these days, right? We live in, a, in a, a, an accelerated age. It's possible that the reforms to informational capitalism will take a shorter period of time. But I tend to think that because what holds up reform more than anything else is, re, is political resistance. That the political resistance is not uh, basically uh, uh, governed by technology. It's governed by the, the arrangement of political power and economic power. And so my suspicion is that uh, 30 years from now, uh, you may gather here, and we may talk about the reforms that we've been able to achieve in the last 30 years to informational capitalism. And many of you in the audience will still be very unsatisfied, thinking there is so much more we could do uh, to basically uh, deal with it. Why am, I, why am I less optimistic? It's very simple. These forces are not simply decisions by a small number of people about how to make money. Their entire social system of power, uh, which is self-reinforcing. And this system of power has basically created brick by brick over the course of several decades. The idea that we would dismantle or even significantly change this system in a few years is implausible. But that does not mean, however, that the system can't be changed. We've seen it done before with respect to industrial capitalism. And so we have to have some degree of hope that reforms to informational capitalism can also occur if there is sufficient mobilization and protest. 
That's why I emphasized in my talk the bottom of the free speech triangle, that is, the actions of civil society and the particular forms of power that civil society has to basically get people interested in the problems, motivated, and uh, placing some degree of pressure on governments to engage in reform. Thank you. Thank you very much. One more question here in the front row. Thank you very much for your excellent talk, Professor. My name is Andras Pünkösti. I'm also working for this uh, research institute here, and I'm especially, ex uh, ex especially glad for the idea you put uh, here that uh, the core of the problem is the market power of, uh, of these giant platforms. We had actually um, a small uh, workshop together. We were arg arguing the same problem. I'm also a competition lawyer, and um, my question is, um, if I understand right, you were suggesting that a um, market would be favorable which has uh, several players on the um, social network market. Don't you think that an oligopolistic uh, market with, with uh, three, four players would be enough uh, to reach that uh, concept which uh, make equalize a parallel um, uh, talk between competition and, um, and pluralism? Since I also um, in favor of your idea that market power is the, the key uh, in order to, to find the proper solution for, for the freedom of uh, expression as well. But is it enough, would, it that, would, would that be enough to reach an oligopolistic market in this, in this regard? What do you mean about, what, what, what is your opinion in this regard? Thank you. Well, from the standpoint of the concerns that we might, the reasons we might have for regulation, which as you remember, uh, you cannot begin to talk about reforms until you talk about the reasons for reform. Um, the concerns are democracy, uh, privacy, security, public health, um, and bodily security, as opposed to simply a consumer welfare, which is the central concern of most competition law, at least in the United States, and to my understanding actually still is the major concern in European competition law, but I could be wrong about that. So remember, when I talk about competition law uh, in my talk, I am not focusing on the central concerns of competition lawyers in the United States. Competition lawyers in the United States focus primarily on questions of consumer welfare, uh, in, understood in a particular way. I'm interested in structural reforms that also concern political freedom, uh, the quality of democracy, uh, uh, public health and safety and security. Um, here, it seems to me, that a relatively small number of companies would be an inadequate. And let me try to explain why I think that. We do have some experience of what it's like to have a world with a relatively small handful of very large platforms. And what we discover is that these platforms tend to purchase uh, and thus sideline new innovations uh, in affordances, security, and, uh, uh, and uh, features. They tend to provide relatively poor protection for privacy. Uh, they tend not to be very interested about uh, public health or bodily security. And they also tend to undermine democracy. And perhaps even worse, a point that I emphasized in my talk, they tend to direct most of their attention to pleasing constituents in the richest countries, Europe and the United States. And they tend to basically give the rest of the world, where the largest number of people live, uh, relatively uh, little attention. And so they produce a shoddy and inferior product. And if we were to continue to have only four, or perhaps even five large companies, we would likely see the very same results occurring. We would see perhaps people in Europe and America a little happier, but we would probably find that people in other parts of the world would continue to be immiserated and undermined and harmed, both in public health and democracy and other issues by these large companies. So it seems to me that the correct solution has to be a much larger group of players in the space. And I'm thinking dozens and dozens. And as you probably know from your studies of competition law, because of the problem of network effects, that's really not going to be a viable solution unless you have very significant interoperability requirements. Because if you don't have interoperability requirements, you will eventually coalesce to a relatively small number of players. 
And I think that a large number of people in competition policy have resigned themselves to the fact that we will have only a relatively small number of large players, primarily because they're worried about the problems of economies of scale and network effects. And so they feel this is the best we can do. And so therefore, perhaps we should do as much as possible in trying to make sure that there are a, a relatively small but relatively equal size of companies so we can get some benefits of competition out of it. My view is I understand the motivation behind that conclusion, but I ultimately think it's not going to be adequate. And so that's why I think we need a lot more. Thank you very much. And I think I have seen uh, someone else here in the first row. So please pass the microphone. Thanks. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Balkin, Oreste Pollicino of Bocconi University, Milan. My question is the following. Uh, it's very interesting, the idea of uh, uh, the um, business model as a real problem. But my question would be, in, in a paradoxical way, the problem related to the restrict freedom to conduct business would be more problematic in Europe than the United States. Because even if there is a clear difference and the liberal approach is uh, it's, uh, like, uh, more close to the United States constitutional spirit, in Europe we have a problem, let's say. We have a charter for fundamental rights in which freedom to conduct business is on equal foot on freedom of speech, Article 16 and Article 11. So how you would solve this apparent paradox? There would be a justifiable restriction to freedom to conduct business or would be an unproportionate one? Thank you. Yes. Well, I mean, I think that, first of all, I claim to be an expert in American constitutional law, but I do not claim to be an expert in European constitutional law. I know a very small bit about European constitutional law, and I can pretend to understand how to do proportionality analysis. So uh, you must forgive me in what I'm about to say, because the constitutional lawyers in the crowd will moan and say, oh, this poor American, what does he know? What I would suggest is the following that uh, no matter which constitutional system that you are engaged in, um, it, uh, businesses will find some constitutional provision which they will use as a means of attacking reform. In the United States, the primary sources of constitutional defense are freedom of expression, the First Amendment, and also uh, uh, just compensation, the takings clause mm -hmm. of the Fifth Amendment. And that's because the United States moved away from uh, a constitutional protection of the right to conduct business uh, sometime in the early 20th, uh, in the middle of the 20th century. In Europe, uh, you have a lot more. You have protections for intellectual, constitutional protection for intellectual property, for the right to pursue a business. You have various freedoms of expression and so forth. So, uh, so if you were a lawyer for a, a large corporation in Europe, you would have many, many more constitutional things that you could use for the purpose. The one thing you have going for you in Europe, which we don't have in the United States, is proportionality review. And the reason why that actually turns out to be better, even though you have a much larger set of constitutional norms, is that proportionality review requires a close examination of the purposes for regulation and a close examination for how they further the, the achieved goal. And it also uh, allows balancing in the final instance. The United States has nothing like that. The United States' rules tend to be much more formalist and uh, inflexible. So it would seem to me that although there are clever lawyers in Europe defending large businesses, I think there are any number of very clever lawyers in Europe uh, that can defend uh, uh, various justifications for privacy, security, and safety. I happen to know some of these lawyers. Some of them come through the United States every night and they talk to us and we are amazed at their, their quality and their ingeniousness. So I am more hopeful perhaps than you are. 